How do you choose a book to read when there's a lot of options to choose from? Sometimes I'm in the mood for an autobiography or fiction. I find myself spending more time making a decision than actually reading. But instead of randomly trying to figure out my next book, I've signed up for a service called Scribd. You get instant access to millions of ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more. You also get thoughtfully curated editor's picks and smart recommendations based on what you've read. That's my favorite part. It makes choosing your next book that much simpler. Scribd puts an amazingly comprehensive and fascinating library of materials at my fingertips and all for just $9.99 a month. That's less than I usually pay for just one book. And right now, Scribd is offering TYT listeners a free 60-day trial. Go to try.scribd.com slash Turks for your free trial. That's try.scribd.com slash Turks to get 60 days of Scribd for free. All right, welcome to the conversation. Now, look, a lot of folks uh, that are uh, juniors uh, have made a great name for themselves. Martin Luther King Jr., for example. Uh, others are mainly known uh, as their dad's son. Uh, for example, Donald Trump Jr., uh, just a sad little boy um, bankrolling off of his dad, it would appear. But is that really how Don Jr. rolls? Well, we're gonna find out because someone wrote a story about that for the New Republicans. Joe Rubin, he's an Emmy winning, Emmy award winning investigative journalist, so this is good stuff. And it's actually a story I had not seen before and I find it really interesting. So, Joe, welcome. Hey, Shane, great to be here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Ah, no problem. So, now, you wrote in particular about a business deal that Don Jr. was involved in. Is starting in 2012, and and I think you're right that it gives you an interesting insight into how Don Jr. rolls, as you guys mentioned in the article. And so let's talk about that deal. It was in South Carolina. Um, what was it about? Yeah, so I mean, let me just back up a little bit. So Don Jr. Um, around 2010 started another business in South Carolina called Titan Atlas Manufacturing. And their goal was to send hundreds of thousands of low income housing kits around the world. And I actually talked to someone who met in Don Jr.'s office with him and Don Jr. You know, peered out his 26th floor window and said, you know, my dad's made his mark. Um, building these, you know, glorious skyscrapers. I want to make my mark a different way. I want to build housing for the poor. And this guy was like pretty moved by that. But the truth is, is this company in in North Charleston really only had one fundamental customer, and that was the mayor of North Charleston, Keith Summy. Otherwise, it left a trail of lawsuits, millions of dollars in debt, hurt a lot of people, um, and so despite this, in 2012. The biggest building in North Charleston, the former Naval Hospital, was up for sale by the federal government. And mysteriously, both Keith Summy and the city of North Charleston and Donald Trump Jr., a new company he formed called Shakur Gardens LLC, both bid on this building. The city won, but here's the strange part, is that Don Jr. and his partners acted like they won. Don Jr. came to town, as we talk about in our story, he met with a landscape architect. And they developed this vision, which showed this naval hospital was gonna be surrounded by essentially like Central Park. There was gonna be a great lawn, there was going to be you know, a Japanese garden, um, a, 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 a playgrounds. And Don Jr. also showed up at a city council meeting. And he and, and, he and his partners said, we're gonna have the Cleveland Clinic. The Cleveland Clinic is gonna be our anchor tenant in this great new development, which is gonna revitalize this poor area of North Charleston. Um, and the Trump, a Trump hotel, a five star Trump hotel will also come in. And this will pay, you know, families of patients, of wealthy patients will come here and other people. And it's gonna be this incredible thing for Charleston. So that was like the promise of the thing. So let me get this straight, a guy named Donald Trump uh, said he was going to do great in business, but instead bankrupted himself. And then in another venture, um, he lost, but pretended he won. Hmm, I wonder where he got all that from. Okay, so now <laughs> already it's super interesting. So he loses the bid, he comes in pretending that he won. It's also kind of a Costanza move. Then what happens next? <laughs> Does he mysteriously win because just because he pretended it? 
So the city agrees to sell this building, which they just bought back to the people who lost the auction or to the people who lost the auction. And you know, despite these promises of like private development, in fact, what we learned through FOIAs and other sources is that they had lined up the county of Charleston who came in and signed a 25 year lease. Um, which, you know, what 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 I was told is that you know John Jr. loved it because the banks loved it because these guys were having trouble getting bank loans. But once they had a, a you know a, 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 a county with a great bond rate come in, they were able to basically take out 20 million dollars in loans and you know to, which kind of disappeared in self dealing companies and in other ways. Um, but the real you know disturbing part is that. You know, person after person, like over a half dozen sources that we talked to, including people who worked for Don Jr.'s company, told us that they basically wrecked the building, that there was this like inexplicable focus on demolishing parts of the building where there were no tenants and then stripping it for copper and other materials. And when I first heard this, I was like, yeah, come on. And I talked to Don Jr.'s main partner there, a guy he's known for, for two decades, who's like a hunting um, friend. And you know, he said, well, we were just recycling, but it was more than that. I mean, what I was told was that this fundamentally undermined the, 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 the safety and the integrity of the building. And it's ultimately why it's you know, uh, just a, a, you know, was left in total ruins. Yeah, so there's so many different like playbooks for scams rolled up all into this one um, uh, business enterprise. So I want to try to break it down. When we get to the judge who gave him the money, that's the part that's the most infuriating. Because how are they going to get paid off this thing is the thing I kept wondering as I'm reading your story. Um, but but it seems like there's a little bit of a private equity type scam here. Because sometimes private equity will get a deal and then they'll just take the loan and put it in their pocket and then let the business rot. And so I'm curious about that part of that's it. That's a really interesting, that's a really interesting point. I want to, I want to talk about the judge, but let's um, let's also talk about uh, you know another way that that, that 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 they were able to enrich themselves through a, a friend of, of Donald Trump Sr. who came in and kind of helped um, rescue them um, after that. If, 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 you think, if you think that's a good uh, 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 yeah. point of conversation. But okay, so Joe Dawson, was the longtime county attorney in Charleston County, um, a you know kind of a um, a confidant, a longtime ally of Tim Scott, who's the senator from South Carolina, and as they were basically um, you know stripping this building of copper and having all kinds of other problems, um, they had a deadline. The deadline was January 1st, 2015. And what we discovered in our investigation is that Joe Dawson drafted a lease amendment. And what that amendment said was that that we're gonna strike that date entirely. Now changing a date, I mean, this happens all the time, you know, construction experts told me, but they, but Joe Dawson just struck the date entirely. And um, you know, people who are, you know, construction law experts told me, multiple people said that this really defied any kind of above board explanation because he just, he represents the county and yet he did something which completely undermined the county's position. And so once the county of Charleston declares, you know, first of all, the county of Charleston cancels the lease because the building is, they say, unsafe, which it seemed clearly it was unsafe. Um, and they, you know, then, uh, Shakur Gardens, Trump Jr.'s company declares bankruptcy. Um, the, the, um, um, you know, the whole thing um, basically unravels because the, the federal judge says, okay, well, you know, you're actually County of Charleston responsible for this lease because of this lease amendment, which this guy Joe Dawson wrote. Um, so Dawson is primarily responsible for taxpayers. Um, you know, having to foot the bill for $33 million. Because otherwise, it seems to us and multiple other legal experts who we spoke to that the, that the judge wouldn't have made that ruling because he cited it, you know, specifically in so, his. Hold up, Joe. So, sure. So, it's complicated. So, yeah, no, no, it's that, okay. So, so, they get the loan for $20 million. Now, in a normal business dealing, what they would do is they would then improve the building. Uh, make it into a great building and start renting it out, right? And then they would make enough money that they would pay back the $20 million loan and they would make a profit, that's normal. 
that's, that's normal business. Sure. So, so in this yes. case, they take the twenty million dollars and they strip the building of its copper. I mean, what a already we're off to a bizarre start in a sense. And I don't know that that's the technical start of of the first things that they did, but at some point they clearly give up and start stripping the building, right? But then the question is. What the hell are they getting 33 million dollars for? Like you go bankrupt. See, that's the thing, man, that's so frustrating to everybody. You go bankrupt if you're a normal person, you're screwed. And you get bankrupt over a medical bill, right. etc. The, the, the guy who negotiated that payment was Joe Dawson, who in the final days of the Trump administration was named as a federal judge and is now, you know, a life has a lifetime appointment as as a federal judge. So, I mean, that's just what happened. You know, whether there was a quid pro quo or not, you know, we weren't, I wasn't part of those conversations. I can only report, you know, what happened. And also that during his confirmation hearings, Mr. Dawson was not, a Judge Dawson was not, you know, forthcoming about, you know, this really this mistake that he had made. You know, people make mistakes, but he, he kind of hid behind it um, in, in written answers to Diane Feinstein. He said, well, this is really, you know, uh, attorney client privilege material. I can't get into it. But, you know, I think he should have at a minimum acknowledged what, what happened. Okay, so, I, so this federal judge is uh, now deciding cases. Is, uh, to me, my opinion is he's obviously a crook. So let's uh, talk about the 33 million though, because the people at home might be going, yeah, but how did they get the goddamn money, right? So is it because right. that this Joe Dawson guy took out the time factor for when they had to deliver? Then when it goes to an actual judge, the judge says, well, the leasing contract says that that you guys owe them money for the, the, the government right. owes them money for the lease well, in perpetuity, basically, they never have to deliver. And so you well, guys owe them thirty-three million dollars. Is that and then? I mean, that's, that's that's why we did the story, you know. And I did the story because as I spoke to people, I found that you know people were hurt here. Um, you know, people were never peed. Workers were exposed to asbestos. Um, there's major health consequences, and you know this this project that was supposed to help people who are you know in need ended up taking away money from from those from those from those things. But you know, one of the things that we discovered was that the security director for Donald Trump Jr's company was actually sending text messages saying, hey, this is this, this is troubling, I'm seeing copper stripping here, I'm telling you about this. He was a whistleblower, but you know, because I think um, Donald Trump Jr and his partners had ingratiated themselves so much to in, you know, in the kind of political culture of Charleston uh, County, with some people, not everyone, there were people who were skeptical too. Um, I think that the, you know that this whistleblower was trying to you know call out this project and put a stop to it. Like his claims never even came up in this you know in this case you know where where these guys got thirty three million dollars. So right. I mean I think there's a lot of I, I think the main point here is that there's a lot of questions that still I think need to be. Answered. I mean, yeah. I spoke to you know, uh, you know, former bid rigging ex uh, prosecutors and experts, and they said there's quite a string to pull on here. Why were these people both still bidding on this? How did then it end up, you know, going to one party, then being sold, and then becoming a government project, which seems, you know, perhaps not the most sincere effort at uh, performing, you know, a, a needed construction project. Yeah. So um, I, yeah. I think that there's that there's something further to investigate here. Yeah. Um, as well look, as to read our, our uh, great no. investigation, New Republic, which I hope people will do. Yeah, everybody read the New Republic piece. We'll put the link down below. Uh, but look, I don't think it's complicated. I think they're all crooks. Uh, and I think they're gonna get away with it because there's no rule of law if you're a right winger in America, especially if your name is Trump. There's no way they're ever gonna get prosecuted. And it's the crooks in the government that did it. Uh, they basically, you can do run this scam with anyone who's politically connected. Go buy a building, have the government lease out a giant thing, so they owe you $33 million, and then go bankrupt instantly and tell the government, give me the goddamn $33 million. And as long as you had a crook inside the government uh, who structured the contract in that way, you'll get your money. And so- um, Yeah, I mean, it's not, my, it's not my place to label you know people crooks or not. But what my I place. can point out, I, I, you, that's you're right, yeah. But I mean, I think what I what I would point out is that um, you know Donald Trump Sr. was actually you know I, I mean he was involved in 
in Donald Trump Jr.'s efforts in in uh, in Charleston, we discovered this. Um, first of all, Don Jr. turned to a longtime confidant of his dad's, Pam Newman, who's been uh, subpoenaed as part of the Manhattan District Attorney's ongoing investigation, um, and um, she helped. Make an argument, and Aon helped make an argument to undo a $1.3 million security deposit, which was supposed to protect taxpayers there. That money then went to Don Jr.'s um, company. Um, we also discovered, do you remember um, uh, the, the, you know, the famous Michael Cohen recording um, of you know, talking yeah. about hush money payments that was released in 2018? Well, I was, I was fascinated by this because in the beginning of that recording, Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the candidate, is talking about um, the Charleston thing, and he's saying, you know, he's calling this bullshit and some claim bullshit and saying he wants it to go away. Well, it turned out he was talking to this same Pam Newman. Michael Cohen, you know, confirmed to our investigation that this was the right. case. Yeah. He was talking to this same um, yeah. Pam Newman, and what he wanted Pam Newman to do was to make a four point five million dollar claim about a leaking roof of a, of a building that Don Jr. owned in in, in North Charleston to go away um, because Don Jr. refused to fix it. So we're seeing you know Don Sr.'s you know longtime confidants showing up in in this story, and we're seeing you know people who are subpoenaed in the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation. So it's, you know it's really you know it's been a you know an interesting um, story to unravel, yeah. and I think there's is more to unravel, as I said, and uh, you know that, that that's you know yeah. it's a very it's a, it's it's quite a quite a tale, I think. Yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting story, and it's an interesting story of how. Uh, Crooks run their scams and how they get away with it. It's not Joe's words, it's my words. They're all crooks and they're gonna get away with it. No one's ever gonna do anything about it. They stole your money down in South Carolina and you let them and you're probably ecstatic about it. Oh, my money got stolen by Donald Trump Jr. Yes, I'll vote for his dad again. That's how this story ends. Okay, but that's my opinion. All right, Joe Rubin, great investigative reporter. Check out his piece. Thank you for joining us. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. How do you choose a book to read when there's a lot of options to choose from? Sometimes I'm in the mood for an autobiography or fiction. I find myself spending more time making a decision than actually reading. But instead of randomly trying to figure out my next book, I've signed up for a service called Scribd. You get instant access to millions of ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more. You also get thoughtfully curated editor's picks and smart recommendations based on what you've read. That's my favorite part. It makes choosing your next book that much simpler. Scribd puts an amazingly comprehensive and fascinating library of materials at my fingertips and all for just $9.99 a month. That's less than I usually pay for just one book. And right now, Scribd is offering TYT listeners a free 60-day trial. Go to try.scribd.com slash Turks for your free trial. That's try.scribd.com slash Turks to get 60 days of Scribd for free. All right, uh, back on the conversation. We've got a great guest for you. Uh, Gabriel Acevedo is a Maryland State delegate. Uh, he's got an interesting bill I want to talk to him about. Uh, it also says uh, that he, in his bio, that he's the first openly gay Afro Latino elected to the Maryland House of Delegates. That's fun. Um, I, the acknowledgement there that there's probably other closeted gay Afro Latinos elected to the Maryland, Maryland House of Delegates is, it might also be true. But uh, Gabriel, welcome to the program, brother. Thanks for having me, Jack. All right. Um, so. Uh, Gabriel, I like your bill. Uh, you um, are eliminating, uh, proposing to eliminate school resource officers, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, so, but Gabriel, how will we criminalize our kids if we don't have cops there? Uh, so, uh, in all seriousness, uh, tell us why you propose this and and the status of it. Yeah, well, according to the Maryland Department of Education, but also a number of independent studies that have been done on the issue of the school to prison pipeline, but also the criminalization of our children. 
Uh, it continues to show that police in schools have a disproportionately negative impact for Black, Latinx, LGBTQ+, as well as students with disabilities. And so the bill that I introduced, the Police Free Schools Act, would not only ban armed police from being stationed in schools across our state, but it would also redirect state funds that have been used to support SRO programs uh, to the data proven solutions that will keep all of our kids safe. And that is you know, investments in counselors and school psychologists, behavior specialists, uh, restorative justice practitioners, people who in essence uh, won't see our kids as inherently criminal uh, and will not continue to perpetuate this school to prison pipeline that siphons uh, black and brown kids, queer kids and students with disabilities from the classroom to the jailhouse. So Gabriel, uh, I, I love the bill because I have a personal connection to it. Because if we had school resource officers or cops or whatever you want to call them in my, you name it, elementary school, junior high, high school, uh, I would have definitely been sent to prison. Um, I got into lots and lots of fights. But back then that was called detention. Uh, now it's called we ruin your life. Um, but. My guess is it is, um, it's not my guess based on national stats, but my guess is in Maryland where I don't have the stats, uh, it also disproportionately affects minority groups, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I live in Montgomery County and according to a study that was done by the Office of Legislative Oversight, um, although black students accounted for a third of enrollment in Montgomery County public schools, uh, they accounted for over half of all of its arrests. Um, according to state data, a majority of the arrests of school-based arrests were, um, were for minor infractions. So in other words, truancy, fighting, um, nonviolent uh, uh, drug-related offenses. And so we're not just ruining children's lives for minor infractions, but we're disrupting their education and we're putting them in this perpetual cycle of not just criminalization, um, but really poverty. And I think it's uh, the civil rights issue um, of certainly of our time because it, it not only relates to education, but it also relates to our criminal justice system. Um, and we can certainly do better and we can build a system uh, that sees the value um, in each and every one of our kids and stop continuing to have a system that criminalizes some of our kids uh, and makes some people feel safe. Uh, when in actuality, um, we can be building a system that cares for all of our kids and keep all of our kids safe. Yeah, so I went to a school that was mixed class, but and and mixed in that it was immigrants and Jews and Christians, etc. But it was in a you know middle class to upper middle class suburb, so ain't nobody going to prison. And and so it drives me nuts when people say there isn't racism. So I remember one of the guys, Smitty, nearly broke some guy's neck. Detention. Okay, it, 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 you can do anything, and you weren't going to go to prison, right? But meanwhile, they're locking up black kids disproportionately while no one's looking, and and it's maddening. So I love that you're trying to do something about it. So what's the status? Is likely to pass or what's the current situation? Yes, yeah, so it's been supported by the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability as we're fighting for a number of police reform measures. Removing cops or SROs from schools is also one of the demands of not just the coalition, but our community. We see a lot of conversation at the congressional level, but also at the state level on a number of police reform measures. Um, and police free schools have to be a part of that conversation because there is a criminalization, there is a lack of accountability uh, that takes place uh, with SROs in schools. In my own county, a five year old black boy was not only terrorized, but handcuffed and berated by uh, county police officers. And footage was later released that not only shook our community, um, but sort of uh, showed what we already knew, which is uh, that uh, criminalization of black and brown kids are routine and that police in schools do not keep our kids safe. And so this is part of our larger effort around police transparency and accountability. Uh, you know, one of the bills, another one of the bills that I've introduced called Anton's Law named for Anton Black, a 19 year old college athlete that was killed in police custody on the Eastern Shore right here in Maryland. 
but also introducing a bill to end qualified immunity in state court um, and to root out white nationalism from law enforcement, which is also um, a systemic uh, and uh, historical problem. And so this is a part of the conversation. Um, it is a part of really the holistic conversation about police transparency and accountability uh, that you know extends from our streets uh, to the classroom and ensuring that we're building a future where black and brown folks can survive and thrive and where our babies can go to school and not be criminalized um, and their education disrupted. Right, so, but I don't know the Maryland House of Delegates and the overall legislature house broken down. So, but I do know from the national level that it, just because you have Democrats in charge doesn't mean you're gonna pass anything. Um, so they never pass anything, they just gave up on criminal justice reform. So what's the breakdown in, in Maryland and if Democrats are in charge, does that really mean anything? Is it gonna pass or not gonna pass? Yeah, well, the Maryland General Assembly is democratically controlled. Uh, this past legislative session in 2021, we uh, passed a number of police reform measures uh, to include uh, a reforming, not repealing, but a reforming of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which is a state statute that Maryland was the first state to pass that other states followed suit that gives law enforcement officers um, these procedural protections and privileges that everyday Marylanders um, and everyday people like you and I do not have. Uh, we also uh, uh, passed a statewide use of force standard, a ban chokeholds, duty to intervene, and we set up a sort of an independent um, investigative and prosecutorial system for these kind of a cases. Um, however, I was one of the few uh, Democrats um, that uh, believed that we didn't go far enough and that we could have and should have gone further. Um, I submitted a number of uh, amendments to include um, you know, creating a system where civilians would have greater oversight and control over public safety. Uh, another amendment to root out white nationalism, to end qualified immunity in state courts, similar to what Colorado and New Mexico have done. And Florida is currently debating that right now. And we see that qualified immunity is failing at the federal level with congressional Democrats. Um, but also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Police Free Schools Act. So um, while it is democratically controlled, we have not seen movement, but we're determined. And if it's one thing I know is that uh, the power of the people is greater than the people in power. And so all of the demands that we're calling for, we're going to achieve um, and ensure that Democrats are accountable to the very people who are impacted. The Democratic Party is so frustrating. They, they never mean anything they say. And so, I mean, even the other issue that you touched on there, cops' bill of rights, that's not the issue. Cops have plenty of rights. The, the issue is the people that they're killing and beating up. They, they, we gotta get them rights. Now, I, I get it, that, that bill of rights was probably passed a while back and you guys are reforming it. That's a positive thing, but you should repeal it. Cops don't need more rights, right. extra rights. They already have plenty, Correct. that is definitely not the issue. And of course, Democrats at best with half measures and it sounds like on your bill, they're not moving it forward. And I've dealt with Maryland before, we, we try to get, um, the Wolfpack legislation through this to call for a constitutional convention to get money out of politics. And nope, uh, powerful people at the last second go, ah, well, we kind of like money in politics. Yeah, that's what we thought. Um, anyways, yeah, well, go well, ahead. What we know is that there can never be true justice, but there should be accountability. Um, and that's precisely why I've introduced a bill such as Anton's Law. Um, uh, bills to end qualified immunity in state court, um, Police Free Schools Act, as well a number, as well as a number of other measures. Um, and while we've seen some success uh, over my first term uh, in the General Assembly on police reform measures, there's so much more that we need to do. As you mentioned, we need to repeal, um, and we did all but repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. We need to set up a system where civilians have greater control over public safety. Um, and that's precisely why I'm running again for the Maryland House of Delegates is because I recognize that we still have unfinished work of police transparency and accountability. Um, and Democrats uh, are accountable to my community, to uh, black and Latinx voters who not only give them and, 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 and uh, sustain their um, uh, uh, power both at the federal and at the state level, um, but our love language is policy. And we need to move beyond performative wokeness 
and all of this, you know, progressive narrative and ensure that we're pushing through the policies such as the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, even though I'd like to see it go a little bit further, um, but as well as the Breathe Act, which was um, proposed by the Movement for Black Lives that would reallocate funding from law enforcement to community infrastructure and social services. And the reason why that's particularly important, and I believe Democrats shouldn't be shying away from uh, this defund the police slogan, because that's exactly what we are calling for. Look, I serve on the Maryland House Appropriations Committee, and as an appropriator, we know uh, when we say fund, defund, or refund, we are in essence having a budgetary discussion. So let's talk about the numbers, right? Uh, Maryland as a state spends more money on policing and incarceration than we do on higher education. As a country, the United States spends around $110 billion annually on law enforcement, more than any other country spends on its military except for China. And so what we see is that we're no more safer, our communities are no more safer, and we're continuing to see instances of police violence. So we have to do something different and we have to look at the data and what the data is showing is that we need to shift funding to the data proven solutions that will keep us safe, such as investments in housing, transportation, economic development, investments in our community and people uh, so that we not only keep our community safe, uh, but we're addressing crime um, in a holistic way as well. All right, look, I am, yeah, we're out of time, but I'm gonna address the last thing to the audience. Look guys, don't get discouraged. There's wonderful young progressives like uh, Gabriel out there. And he's fighting the good fight, and we're gonna eventually win. Uh, so we all get frustrated by old corporate Democrats uh, that are intransigent and and seem to uh, lack any fire and don't wanna take action. But Gabriel, when you talk about the love language, my uh, wife's a therapist, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and it's exactly right, our language is policy. We don't care about your rhetoric, and we don't care about your political theater, pass the damn bills. Because if we don't pass the bills, we haven't helped anyone other than ourselves, by the way. And so, so I'm not interested in politicians trying to help themselves. I'm interested in people like you that are actually trying to pass bills. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a delegate and for fighting for the right things. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jane.